Hello and welcome to our filmmaker Q&A following the screening of Balancing, films about holding steady, falling down and finding your equilibrium from the Women Over 50 Film Festival 2021. My name is Felicity Beckett and I produce online video content for Picture House Cinemas and it is my absolute pleasure to host this event with a full house of filmmakers from all over the world. So filmmakers, can I please invite you all to give a wave and a hello? Thank you. So with no further ado, I'm going to go to our first filmmaker and welcome the birth of Valerie Venus filmmaker, Sarah Clift. Hi, Sarah. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Sarah, can you tell us about the origin of Valerie and this great fun story? Uh, okay, um, well, first of all, thank you for screening the film. We're very excited that you, you're putting it on. Um, the origin uh, really started about exploring women's sensuality and sexuality and, uh, and having a sort of more female lens uh, with this. So I was really interested in exploring sort of uh, the female orgasm and uh, various things around that space. And as I was doing so in my exploration of this, um, I, it felt very much like sensuality and sexuality was owned by the youth. You know, every time I was looking for references, it was, you know, I, I was just, and I suppose this became more of like a personal journey of that I really actually wanted the character um, to be an older woman and uh, create a sort of beautiful and sensual story about a woman uh, sort of liberating herself and rediscovering herself. So it really sort of, um, I think it was just that the idea I really wanted to create something that wasn't usually on screen with regards to this. Can you tell us what the reaction has been to your film and what are your hopes for its future? So the reaction has been great uh, for the birth of Valerie Venus. Um, it's quite an uh, unusual, um, uh, eccentric idea, I suppose, uh, in quite a parochial uh, version of England. Um, my previous film had been in Spanish, set in Mexico, and this is, uh, I wanted to go completely the other extreme in the UK. Um, and yeah, it's it's sort of something that you wouldn't normally see on screen. Um, it's very aesthetic, and I think people find the whole package very pleasing. But really, it's all down to Jane Gurnier and her performance as Valerie that she just steals the show and blows everyone away. So, yeah, it's very exciting. It is. I couldn't agree more. It was fabulous. If you haven't seen it, you, everyone, you must go and watch it. It's just such an unexpected great fun can I say romp <laughs> yeah, romp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> romp for one yes <laughs> thank you Sarah so next I'd like to welcome Thuri Bara Bergestotter who's made a fascinating and beautifully shot film from pasture into hands about an Icelandic family who rears and trains the most extraordinary horses so Thuri, can you tell us about, oh sorry, how your documentary came about? Well, it started like I really wanted to do a documentary about training of a horse. And when I thought about the character that I wanted to be in the lead role would be a woman that has been around and done it for a long time. So uh, I was, I remember I was pacing back and forth in my apartment. I was thinking, who should I pick? And I suddenly remember, oh my God, the news are on. And I turned on the TV and uh, Ulle Amble, who is the, who, who is the lady who, who is uh, breeding these horses along with her husband, um, she was having an interview in the, in the television. And I was like, yeah, that's her. Uh, so, so that's how it came about. Um, and uh, I had some time talking to her and, and she was like, I don't know, but now I think she's quite happy with the results and, and how it went. And all the family, they were part of it as well. Were they all quite happy to take part? Yes, some, some, some are like, oh, please don't mind me, no. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, they are quite happy to, go along with it and and they quite enjoyed it when they saw it 
And um, I, I had, I, I mean, I know a little bit about horses, but I'd never seen anything like the the um, trotting racing that you um, portray in the film. Is this particular to Iceland? And what's the international re response been? Like, wow, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, well, uh, this film has not, it, it's like the first time it's shown actually abroad is, is with you. So, uh, because it's actually a student film. Uh, I did this, this was my final project from the Film School of Iceland. I started late to, to learn this. And um, uh, so it's been, uh, yeah, it's the only time it has been shown before, so. Okay. It's like, it's like premiere for, for me, international yeah. premiere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And what is the, what is the breed of horse? It's the, it's the Icelandic horse. We only have one breed. Uh, the Vikings brought the, the horse when they uh, came to Iceland. And actually, I don't think that they have imported any horses since then. So it's, it's been here isolated for thousand thousand years. Yes. More than Amazing. Thousand years. Yeah. Well, thank you for bringing them to our screens. They are extraordinary, extraordinary horses. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So um, now I'd like to welcome Karen Kasia, uh, creator of Clearing, which is a mesmeric and beautiful film. Karen, please can you tell us about its inspiration and the, significant of the significance of the land that it was filmed on? The land is uh, where I've been living for most of the pandemic. And uh, nine months into the pandemic, I found myself alone. Um, in um, it's on Lake Huron in Ontario. I'm in Toronto right now, um, Ontario. And I found myself alone one morning. It happened to be Christmas morning. Um, and all of my family had already left because we celebrate Hanukkah. And although it's a time of gathering, for we often will go to other people's homes. Uh, I found myself alone in a snowstorm um, up north in Ontario. And um, when I get into those places with myself and my children, my family are all vacated, uh, something comes over me and I think the weather really affects me. And so I just had this idea to capture, to go outside and spend 15 minutes in the snow and improvise. So uh, I didn't really want to set up uh, the phone. It was just shot on an iPhone. I didn't want to set it up myself because the wind might have blown it over. So I called my 13 year old great niece to <laughs> come on over. She was down the street in uh, their place as well. So she came over and I explained to her how to hold the camera. She'd never done it. and. I improvised with the material and um, then I kind of took a painterly approach to mm. in a way create a painting of material and uh, it very much came from a melancholic place where my children were gone and I was alone and all of that which comes or came with the pandemic at that time nine months in. And um, dance is such a personal language. I, um, I have my own sort of interpretation of how I felt when I watched you. And I was just wondering, have you been surprised by what people might have fed back to you about what they've taken from the film? Yeah, um, I think it's just starting to, I just began to send it to festivals and it's about to head into four festivals, including your own. So it hasn't been screened yet. Ah, okay. Um, but, and I've shown it to a few people and they've enjoyed it very much, but what I was going to say is that it's so interesting that it was uh, placed into the balancing program because so much of my work as an artist is based on the essence of imperfection and the precarious nature of stability versus uh, destabilization. And while I was dancing um, in that area, um, I was slipping all over the place because my shoe, my boots didn't have any tread. So all of what happened was like either stable or unstable. And so I just, yeah, found that really interesting. Yeah. So thank you so much, Karen. And now I'd like to welcome back to WAF, Lucretia Knapp and Lynn Yamamoto, who were WAF 19 filmmakers. 
Uh, but this year they've come back with a very moving and poignant piece called And Yet. Lucretia, I'd like to invite you please to tell us about the genesis of this idea and bringing it to life. So during the lockdown for all of us, there were limitations and um, we've been in our home mostly since March. And um, we were looking at the space um, and contemplating um, our own mortality and um, the dance that becomes um, a significant part of the piece. Uh, Lynn and I, um, we're married and we just occasionally spontaneously do this little dance. And I always thought it would be um, wonderful to have it recorded. Uh, so we had this opportunity. Wonderful. And it is important, isn't it? It's, it's, I think it's a Buddhist thing to contemplate death and mortality in that way, to really meditate on it and imagine it and to see it, to see life without you in it. You know, it's a very sort of healthy thing to do. And it felt like a very safe space that you created to do this. I wondered what other people's reactions were. I, I absolutely loved it. As far as um, other, oh, is this for Lynn? Sorry, yes, I meant to direct that to Lynn. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Well, actually, um, Wolf is going, will be the first um, opportunity for other people to see it. We, we haven't even shown it to friends yet. I mean, we, we finished it shortly before the deadline, so um, it, it's very fresh um, for us. But it's interesting you bring up that point about Buddhism because the title actually is part of um, a haiku that was written by um, a kind of 18th, 19th century Japanese poet, um, Kobayashi Issa. And the entire poem has to do with acknowledging the ephemerality of life. So it speaks about the world of dew. Um, but at the same time, also acknowledging or kind of reconciling the fact that we understand that life is ephemeral that the people we love will not always be with us, but we still it, it will still be painful. We still experience pain at thinking about their leaving. So it's kind of interesting that you brought that up. Mm. Yeah, well, I definitely felt it was a meditation. Was that your intention, do you think, in the presentation? I'll ask that to Lucretia, sorry. <laughs> um, Part of the um, absence of uh, sound mm -hmm. is actually, yeah, it goes along with um, allowing the viewer to um, take in the work and, and to reflect and in that way meditate. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And I'm, I'm really honoured to be one of the first people to watch that. And I hope that other people enjoy it as much as I, I did. Absolutely. Thank you. So moving on to our next filmmakers, which are Lucy Richardson and Karen Spicer, filmmakers of Midlife, The Skin We're In. So Lucy, I'd like to invite you first to tell us about the making and writing and coming together of this bold, colourful, and really brilliantly performed piece. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we made, just before um, lockdown happened, we made a theatre piece um, where we wanted to explore the experience of the menopause um, and look at it as a, a time of transformation and ultimately celebration. Um, and we worked, I worked as a director, a theatre director with the three women who were in the film um, and explored their stories. And we made a, a theatre piece which uh, 
looked at rage and anxiety and lots of the troubles that come with uh, being midlife, but ended up uh, celebrating it and with the entire audience on the stage, uh, disco dancing to <laughs> I am what I am. And uh, it was a, a celebratory piece. And then we went, so as soon as we'd done it, uh, we went into lockdown and we decided we wanted to uh, do something else. And we'd never made a film before, uh, but we thought we'll we'll try and turn that idea into a film and focus specifically on uh, the three women's bodies and mm -hmm. their relationship to their bodies as um, things that have challenged them in a variety of ways, but uh, which ultimately they want to celebrate. Um, and so we we put the three women in uh, their, their home places, uh, the allotment and the bath and the riverside and we uh, explored that working with a writer and uh, a musician who sang the score for, for the piece. And um, Karen, I was really struck by these women's presence on screen. Can you tell me about how you went about capturing that? Um, well, first start the three of us, me and Claire and Jackie, we've known each other like as creatives <clears throat> since the 80s. And we've all been part of this political movement, theatre movement of, um, you know, women and politics and theatre. And we've all loved each other for years and never had a chance to actually work with each other. And also, as we were getting older and we were getting more and more interested in, in our bodies and our minds and what was happening and in, inquiring about that. We started to see that all these fantastic women, including ourselves, who've been in theatre and been creators for years, were suddenly disappearing. Mm -hmm. You know, were suddenly not allowed to be there or told what kind of role they should be. And we went, no, yeah. no, we're not having that. And, and that's where it started from, really. And then, you know, the joy of then meeting Lucy, who is just a fantastic fantastic director and you know and she and all these women working together and just going yes and you know if someone said oh you're not allowed to do that then th no we're, we're gonna do what we do was well, incredible so I think the presence came from the fact mm -hmm. that we were doing things that we wanted to do not that was prescribed to us to do but that we as women wanted to explore and I think when you're given that permission um in in a world where we're sidelined um, then, you know, we had the permission to enjoy, and so we did. Absolutely, and it definitely came across. It was very confrontational, but also inviting. You know, it wasn't um, uh, aggressive, but it was very dynamic. You know, so I, I really enjoyed it. Well, what's other people's reactions been, Lucy? Yeah, I mean, people have, have universally seemed to really enjoy it. Uh, someone said that it should be prescribed on the NHS uh, and people should have to watch it every morning. So I think that was my favourite comment. <laughs> Perfect. I couldn't agree more. Thank you both so much for joining us at WOF today. So moving on to um, one of the most unusual films that I think I've seen in a very long time from um, Ed, or well, Ed is here to represent Nudinitz and Bernard and Barbara's Big Ding Dong. So Ed, would it be fair to say this is a knitted stop motion animation um, that is also extremely saucy? <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, from a kind of a uh purely visual point of view everything that you see on the screen is knitted and and so yeah and all shot with stop motion uh, puppets all in camera and um yeah and it's all all the script is all the characters um kind of speaking innuendo but completely innocently uh and on top of that they're all nudists but no one ever mentions it and nobody ever realizes that they're being nude it's all played completely straight so kind of all the humour, it kind of exists in the mind of the viewer. It's it's just great fun. And I will never be able to look at the Reverend Richard Coles quite the same way again. If, yeah, if, the character's slightly based on him. <laughs> slightly, I would say, definitely. But all fun aside, technically, it's a really quite, you know, hardcore film, <laughs> for want of a better word. Um, yeah, tell me about how long it took to make. Um, 
well, this, it, this was kind of, uh, this was our third Nudinets film and we um, had like a kind of Christmas deadline of it on it because it was originally made as the individual bits um, to promote um, a book because Nudinets isn't just uh, films, it's also every year there's a calendar uh, and there's um, three books with it and there's a new one coming out uh, this Christmas. Um, so there's this kind of rolling production of endlessly make, making these things and um, yeah so we kind of built up a big bank of um, uh, kind of sets and stuff from doing previous films and uh, I think we storyboarded it on like the hottest day of the year and uh, the year before last and uh, like, we were sort of sat there melting coming up with um, you know Christmas things um, and then, yeah, from that point onwards, it's it was kind of like full steam ahead to try and kind of get it done before like the end of November, uh, ready to roll out. So yeah, about sort of from sort of storyboarding to to finish is about sort of five months. Okay, I was expecting to hear longer because um, my my own experience of talking to stop motion animators is you know quite significant time so you know that was pretty good going for you all and um and it's wonderful to have you in the WAF lineup I absolutely loved it thank you so much for joining us Ed and that brings me on to Susan Hillary welcome and thank you so much for your documentary The Pratt in the Hat what I would like to ask, first of all, is Pratt, does that have the same connotation in America as it has in the UK? I don't know what the connotation in the UK is, but that's her, uh, name. her name is Dr. Frances Pratt. It is, but yes. Pratt is quite, is a little bit of a, an unkind thing to call someone in oh. the UK. So uh, I just, because I, I, I found that the title just slightly jarring, because I just wondered if you knew that that's what it meant in the UK. I didn't. It was a play on the cat in the hat. And yes. Her name is yes. Pat, and everyone calls her that. Ah, so that's okay. That's how interesting. It came about. <laughs> so I did not know that. So it's just a warning that that, okay. it, yes, it's. Because <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I thought, well, that's not very nice. She's lovely. <laughs> then <laughs> then I, I saw that that was her name. So, yeah. And so, ca can you tell me about how you came to make this wonderful piece about this extraordinary woman? Well, what happened was we live in a small community, Nyack, New York, which is about uh, an hour northwest of New York City. And I have been very involved with. Um, anti-nuclear issues and political issues in our area. And I was invited to uh, some political dinner, which I find horribly boring. And there I saw Dr. Pratt with her amazing hats in the back of the room. She was sort of alone. I guess she, she goes to all these different things because she for 40 years was the head of the NAACP. So she um, was there and I was just totally attracted to her. I just walked over to her and uh, you know she wears these beautiful colored hats with matching outfits. And I just asked her whether I could photograph her in her hat that she was wearing then. And she said, well, you know, I have over 300 hats. And I was like, well, can I photograph you in your hats? And so it sort of started with the idea of maybe being a coffee table book initially. But then as I started filming her, first of all, I found out that she had been a very good friend of both my parents that I didn't know. And um, I, uh, and she's quite an amazing woman, has quite an amazing life story. So then it evolved into a film. And this is the first film I've made in 20 years. I, prior to this, I was producing feature films in Los Angeles. And then I moved back New York, to New York to take care of my parents and my, raise my children. And so I sort of have been on hiatus. So it was really a wonderful experience for me to actually not really know I was going to be making a film, thinking I was doing a coffee table book and it turning into a film. And that's sort of how it happened. And I sort of fell in love with her and she's an amazing woman. She is absolutely incredible. And I, and I love how you've just described how the documentary came to being because I really had a sense when I was watching the documentary that it gracefully revealed the woman of such bravery and integrity that is Dr. Frances Pratt. And it was like peering under one of her hats. And that's what it made me think. And I, and I just wondered about that reveal as to who she was. Is that, was that your 
journey? It was my journey, but it's interesting. You know, she's 90 years old and she has her story down. So when you when anyone asks her about her life, she basically says pretty much the same thing. So she says it in a chronological order, more or less. And I did not want to tell a straight chronological story. It didn't reveal itself well. So it was really a lot in the editing and re restructuring the, her storyline. And, and really, my focus was the hats. Initially, that's what I was drawn to her about. The hats are sculptural and beautiful. And uh, as an artist, as a painter, I really looked at all the colors and sort of integrated all the colors. And Actually, when we first started shooting, we had her changing her, her outfits because each hat matches an outfit, but she got very ill. She ended up in the hospital with pneumonia. So we had to rethink how we were shooting it. And so you don't notice it, but she basically, if she's wearing yellow hat, she's wearing pretty much the same yellow shirt. I just had her changing hats and rather than the costumes every time. So I, I initially want to color, cut it as like a rainbow where I went from color mm -hmm. to color, but I couldn't because then her shirts were, it would be obvious that she was wearing the same thing all the time. So it evolved basically because of the restrictions we had. Sometimes these are such happy accidents in a way. I mean, I don't wish her ill, of course, but sometimes the, isn't it that the, the, the documentary reveals itself to us through, through the, the adversities that we might have find as filmmakers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Susan, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your film. I've, thoroughly enjoyed it and th that brings us to the end of our Q&A today and I want to thank all our filmmakers um, so if I could ask you all to unmute and wave goodbye to all our viewers and any salutations that come to mind just please do speak now <laughs> but thank you everyone thank you thank, thank you. you bye, bye. Let's call you <laughs>